You ever set something aside for a special purpose? Uh, There's times in life where we set things aside because we have a specific use, specific purpose for that thing. And I know in my house, I'll set something aside for a specific purpose, and it takes maybe three minutes before one of my children grab it and use it for anything but that specific purpose. And often, whenever that happens, it tends to ruin what it is, right? Right? And it tends to make me have to go get another one so that we can set it aside. Or if you're like me and you see something in the fridge that looks really appealing. I love apple juice, but we never keep apple juice in the house. And so we have apple juice in the fridge one day. And so I look and I go, oh, look, there's apple juice. So I took a glass of apple juice and I drank it. And then if you've not had apple juice in a while, it's pretty addicting, right? And so then you go, you know, I'm still thirsty for apple juice. And so I go get another glass and another glass. And then I'm done with the apple juice until later when my wife comes in and opens up the fridge and she goes, Josh? And I said, yes, dear, because that's always how I respond, right, honey? She goes, did you drink the apple juice that was for the children? I said, what are you talking about? I only had like one glass, honey. She said, it's almost all gone. It was brand new when I walked away this morning. That was for the kids. I said, well, honey, I'll go get some more apple juice. Why did I have to replace it? Because it was for a specific purpose. And guess what? I got more apple juice, and I've been drinking that apple juice too. Look, it's not my fault. I drink quicker than the kids on this stuff. But have you ever set something aside for a specific purpose? Do you remember why you chose it for that purpose? Do you remember why you chose it maybe over another item or another tool for that purpose? Have you ever set something aside thinking it'll do the trick only to find out it won't do anything that you need it to do? I was fixing my sprinkler system the other day because everyone knows how awesome. No, I'm not not really awesome at this, but I was fixing it. So it only took me about six trips to Lowe's before I finally got the right part set aside before I finally was able to anoint this part as you are anointed to be part of my sprinkler system. Why? Because it doesn't matter what it says on the outside, everything's mislabeled at Lowe's apparently. Or it could be the user error, who knows. But this morning we're talking about this idea of setting aside, being anointed, being commissioned to do a specific purpose in life. As we discuss what it means to be set aside for a specific purpose, I want to end out Isaiah whenever he reminds Christians today of the following five things when it comes to being anointed. And the first is what I just said, as Christians, as God's servants, we are anointed. We are anointed. We forget this. This is an important thing found all throughout Scripture, all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that God's People are anointed. We don't talk about this much in the Church of Christ for some reason, but we are an anointed people. We are commissioned for something. We are set aside for something. We have been given special tasks. Isaiah chapter 61, the very first part of verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord God has anointed me. Me, says Isaiah. Now this is interesting because the Spirit and the anointing of God and and the coming of the Spirit, descending upon someone with that anointing, is often seen as simultaneous in Scripture. But there's a difference in the Old and the New Testament in this. In the Old Testament, if you read, the Holy Spirit and the anointing of an individual comes and goes in their lifetime. It may rest upon them for a while and then go back, or it may rest upon them their whole life, but it is never among all of the people of God simultaneously in the Old Testament. That's why you see prophets who are specially anointed, and you see the Spirit of God descend upon Saul, and then it goes away from Saul and descends upon David because the Spirit was not often with the entire mass of the people of God in the Old Testament. So this is a powerful statement for Isaiah to say, and that is, I have been anointed. And I have the Spirit of God on me. In the Old Testament, it comes and goes and it generally resides with individuals rather than groupings of people. 
It came upon David. It came upon Elijah and then was transferred to Elisha when Elijah went up. Other instances has it coming and going in the Old Testament. But something changes when Christ comes with the anointing and with the Spirit. Something important changes. You see the Spirit with John the Baptist. And then you see Christ and the Spirit comes and descends upon Christ at His baptism. And it stays with Christ. It doesn't come and go. It stays with Christ. And then Christ dies on a cross and He's risen from the grave. And then in Acts chapter 2, you see they're anxiously awaiting the Spirit. And the Spirit descends. And the Spirit never leaves again. Have you noticed that in Scripture? In Acts 2, when it comes back, it never leaves until Christ comes to take us home. It doesn't come and go anymore. Now, it might come and go if I turn away from God and stop following God. I'm no longer anointed, right? It's going to leave. But as long as I follow God, it is not picky. It says, this man is my chosen instrument. He is anointed with the Spirit. Therefore, the Spirit will dwell with him until I bring him home. Christ, when He goes back to heaven, He sends the Spirit. He sends the Helper. He sends that which anoints us. The Spirit now dwells within man. Not just a man, but mankind. Those who are called Christian. Romans 8, verses 9-11 through 11 reads, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Notice, if you belong to Christ, you have His Spirit in you. It dwells within you. It lives within you. Verse 10, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Do you see a common theme here? Dwelling, dwelling, dwells in you, dwells in you, dwells in you. What does it mean to be anointed? It means to be set aside for a specific purpose and have the Spirit of God residing in you. Church, we need to pick this word back up. We need to proudly carry the word anointed. Because if you are a Christian, you have the Spirit of God. We have been given the Spirit to carry out the purposes of God. As Christians, as God's servants, we are also anointed to proclaim the good news. So it's not just that we're anointed. We're anointed to proclaim the good news. Now the good news encompasses several things, but look, Again, in chapter 1 of Isaiah 61, it says, The Lord God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. This is found all throughout Scripture. Ezekiel talks about the good shepherd who brings that good news, who binds up and who uh, goes and finds the lost sheep and all of this. It's found also in the New Testament. The reality is we're not just anointed, we're anointed to proclaim good news. Isaiah, in the midst of what seems like doom and gloom, he starts out in verse 1 saying, this is good news. Church, we bring good news. We're not set aside to nitpick. We're not set aside, as we talked about in class this morning, to be us versus them whenever it comes to others. We're not set aside to tear into what we disagree with about other people. We are set aside to bring good news and healing to this world. That is why we've been anointed. That is why the Spirit lives within us. It is not just to mark us as God's chosen. It is not just to mark us as anointed. It is not just to help us. It is inside of us to help us bring about the good news. Isaiah says he has been anointed to bring good news and to bind up those who are brokenhearted. The brokenhearted, who are they? Well, when you read Isaiah, it's those who are poor. It's those who are struggling. It's those who are experiencing injustice. It's those who are in prison. We are to bring good news to these. It's the good news of the healing of the heart and the binding of the wounds, spiritual, emotionally, and physically. 
This is found throughout Scripture, not just in Isaiah. Deuteronomy 15, verse 11 says, For there will never cease to be poor in the land, therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Proverbs 14, verse 31 says, Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors his maker. God is saying over and over in Scripture, we have been anointed to bring good news to those who are poor, those who are hurting, those who are not in the same life situation as us. Luke 14, verses 12 through 14 says, He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do you invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors? Let lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, church, this is important. We've been anointed to do this type of stuff. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection. And then finally in 1 John 3, verse 17, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Church, we are called to be people who are anointed to bring good news to those who are hurting, not good news to those who only have good lives. That means we have to get out and get our hands dirty and our lives in the messy lives of other people, doesn't it? It means we have to walk alongside of them in their pain and in their hurt. It means that we have to be willing to go out and say, I'm not the only one who's been anointed, but God calls you to do the same. To say God calls you home to Him so that He can bind you up, He can heal you, He can help you so that you too then can go out and continue the process. We've not only been anointed to proclaim good news, we've been anointed to proclaim freedom. The last part of verse 1 in Isaiah 61, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Do we proclaim freedom found in Christ Jesus? We've been set aside for a special purpose, church. We do a really, really good job, especially on Facebook, proclaiming what we're disgusted with. But do we proclaim freedom with the same passion? Do we proclaim freedom from sin? Freedom from whatever binds us on this earth? Freedom from worry? Do we proclaim freedom? Freedom from selfishness. Even in the confines of the, his Philippian prison, Paul was free. In fact, Paul writes and he says, don't worry about me. What's going on with me has only advanced the gospel and made people more bold. You see, freedom is not something physical. It's something mental, isn't it? Let's be honest, God may never free us from a physical binding that we might have, whether that's health or something else, until the day that we go see Him. While we live on this earth, we may physically never be free. We might even be in prison as Paul was, and we're not physically free, but God promises a spiritual and a mental freedom that nobody, nobody can remove. Do we proclaim that freedom? But do we also try to offer the physical freedom when we have that opportunity? Isaiah 61, verse 8, I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. Do we love justice? Do we want to see the right thing done? And do we fight for that? But we've also been anointed to proclaim comfort and joy. In verses 2 and 3 of Isaiah 61, the Lord has anointed me, it says, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, 
the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, do we proclaim comfort and joy to those that we come into contact with? Just as Isaiah and Christ proclaim comfort and joy to those who mourn, we too are messengers of comfort and joy. Now, I talk about this, and I want to be clear again about this. Comfort does not mean when somebody dies, you walk up and say, well, it just must have been part of God's plan. Well, God just needed another little angel in heaven. Not only is there theologically so many things wrong with that, being that angels are created being separate from humans, but that's not comforting the most people. Comfort is sitting there like the friends of Job did putting your arm around them, saying, look, I know this is horrible. I can't imagine what you're feeling, but I'm right here for anything you need. Or you know what? Maybe don't even say a word and just sit next to them and love on them and hug them. Comfort is saying, I wish I could change your circumstance, but I can't. But what I can do is help you find hope in the midst of that circumstance. What about joy? Not all of us are privileged, like joy, to have the name joy. But we all have that mission of spreading joy, don't we? How many of us as Christians walk around and spread anything but joy? Don't raise your hand, please. How many of us walk around with a long face and, oh, my life is horrible? Woe is me, I can't... Look, everyone has moments in life like that, right? I'm not saying we can't say life is rough. I'm not saying put on a fake uh, facade when you come in here. How's your day going? Oh, it's going great. If it's not, I'm not saying lie about it. But what I'm saying is, how are you out there among the non-Christians? You wonder why some people don't want anything to do with Christianity. Look at half the Christians out there and how they act in the world. Are they ambassadors of joy? No. You know what I love about Lakewood? We have a lot of people that are joyous. I love it. I come to church, and I know we all struggle and suffer, but there's a joy even in the midst of you who struggle and suffer that gives me joy in the midst of my struggling and suffering. Do we take that to the world? Again, we're anointed, we're set apart to go proclaim these things, not just to each other, but to the world. Do we take that same joy out into the world? And do we do it in a way that honors Christ? We're anointed to proclaim righteousness. We proclaim a message of righteousness to the world. Isaiah 61 verse 3 in the latter half says that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. We are out there. Now, we often misunderstand this, I believe. When we are to proclaim righteousness, it is not a holier-than-thou righteousness. It is a not you're unrighteous versus light, right? Us versus them. You're un- I'm not pointing in over here, buddy. I'm not pointing at you. We're not saying you're unrighteous and I am righteous. What is it? It's that he might be glorified. Are we proclaiming God's righteousness? You see, a lot of times we we struggle with that because we're proclaiming either our righteousness or their unrighteousness. And in reality, it's supposed to be proclaiming God's righteousness. And we do that in everything we say and do, theoretically. Theoretically. Because let's be honest, that's easier said than done, isn't it? I was coming home from my uh, nephew's graduation late last night. By the way, 10.30 p.m. coming from Beaumont on I-10. All the loonies are out there driving. Just want to be clear. Bless their heart. (laughs) You know, here's the thing. Not that anyone could see me in my car, but it was really hard to ask me to declare the righteousness of God when a semi almost hit me because he was not paying attention that me and everyone in front of me was coming to a stop on the interstate. But how do we respond to situations? Do we show the righteousness of God in those 
responses. You see, the righteousness of God and how we respond is different from our normal. You see, whenever whenever we're trying to do our normal fleshly response, we're watching Jesus getting taken away and we want to draw the sword and cut off or chop off somebody's ear or head, don't we? Jesus' response is, I'm not here to start a riot. Put your sword up. When somebody forces me to do something that I don't want to do, or they talk ill of my family, or they talk ill of me, or even talking ill of my Savior, my response is, put your dukes up. We're doing this right now. Jesus' response is, love them, don't hate them. Love them, don't hit them. Whenever somebody steps on my ego, because we all have fragile egos, egos, don't we? My response is to get defensive. God's response is don't worry about your ego. Focus on God's ego. God's glory. You see, we change how we respond when we understand it's about the righteousness of God, not us. It changes everything we do. We do everything. We proclaim everything. We are set aside, not because we're special, but because He's special. We're anointed for this task, for these tasks, so that God is glorified, not Josh. So that God is glorified, not the Lakewood Church of Christ. So that God is glorified, not you, but God. We've been set aside. We've been anointed for a purpose. We've been given the Spirit of God, anointed to proclaim good news of freedom, comfort, joy, and righteousness. This church is our calling. We may go about it in different ways, with different personalities, but we must make certain that we're going about the work of God by proclaiming these things so that God is glorified and so that we can stand on the day of judgment and God says, I knew I was right in anointing you for this task. All of these and more are found in Jesus Christ and that is who we proclaim, church. My question this morning is God has chosen you to be anointed for these tasks. He has chosen you to be those who go into the world. Jesus could have stayed here for the last 2,000 years, but Jesus knew that if he stayed, his people would not pick it up nearly as much as if he left and sent his helper. You were specially anointed to fulfill the ministry of Jesus Christ. How are you doing at that? This morning, maybe you haven't accepted the task. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you haven't been baptized and been forgiven of your sins. Maybe you don't even know where to start on accepting the task. We offer you the opportunity. We will help you. We will either share that starting point or if you know where you are at and you want to get baptized, we have water right behind me and we can baptize you and get the ball rolling right now. But maybe you're a Christian and you've forgotten or you've struggled with that anointing that you've received. And maybe you'd like the prayers and support of this congregation. Well, we're here for you as well because we've all struggled with it. The only perfect man who ever lived was Jesus Christ. We've all struggled. We're not here to judge. We're here to help. But we can't help if we don't know how and if we don't know who needs the help. We simply ask if you would like the prayers of this church to be baptized or help in other ways. You come forward and let us know as we stand and sing this song.